Okay, that's a great start. Uh, <laughs> that concludes the, tonight's event. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Jamie Baker. Um, I'm the director of the Syracuse University Institute for Security Policy and Law. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of uh, Ryan Williams and the Wa uh, Maxwell and Washington team, as well as um, Dean Van Slyke. Uh, Dave was planning to come down tonight, but at the last minute was unable to do so. Uh, so he does send his regrets, and, and he, he genuinely does have regrets because he was really looking forward to hearing uh, from our discussants this evening. Uh, our theme tonight is learning from the past to inform the future. And I could think of uh, when I was putting together this event, um, the first three names I came up with turned out to be the three people on this stage. Uh, as it turns out, and, I, and I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes telling you why. I'm not going to do a dramatic reading of their biographies. Um, in the case of Tom Pickering, that would require six or seven hours. Uh, so we're going to minimize that. But um, I will tell you a little bit about each person. Um, I've known two of them uh, longer than uh, the other. Um, but um, so first, Tom Pickering. Uh, as, as everybody in this room will know already, that he is one of the distinguished uh, great diplomats in American history, uh, not just the past couple of decades, but in American history. And I've always found it easier to name the countries to which he was not ambassador <laughs> than to do it the other way around. So, Antarctica. Uh, <laughs> As ambassador to the UN, uh, you will recall, or you have learned, that he was the pivotal actor um, in bringing together the Security Council and UN coalition in response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Um, that's an example of his work. Um, he was Under Secretary of State uh, for Policy, the number three position at the Department of State during the Clinton administration as a career ambassador. And what I would like you to know about Tom is that he treated the people who sat behind him in the Situation Room with the same dignity, respect, and kindness as he treated the people who were at the table. That's not always a Washington feature, but that's a Tom Pickering feature. Tom Ahern, as your program will state and attest, served with great distinction as an intelligence officer all over the world during the Cold War, including as chief of station in Tehran in 1979. So that's a noble fact. Less noble fact is that he's continued to serve his country in a greater good in fake retirement. Uh, he, he's gone to work every day since he fake retired um, for the sole purpose of doing exactly what the theme of tonight's session is, is learning from the past to inform the future. So he has written two books. Um, one is called Vietnam Declassified, and, and I managed to forget it tonight, but it's, it's about that thick. And it's a history of uh, U.S. and CIA counterinsurgency efforts in Vietnam. And it's been called Meticulous, Balanced, well-researched. It's a book I commend all of you to read. His book on Iran, So Little Wisdom, American Intelligence in Iran Under the Shah, well, that's shorter because the unclassified version is a page. It's the title page. Um, as the sometime chair of the Public Interest Declassification Board, I, I would recommend the declassified book. Um, so here's what I'd like you to know about Tom Ahern. He is a rare, if not unique, ability to consider events of which he was a part with dispassion, humility, and grace, all the characteristics of a great intelligence officer. Osama Khalil, Professor Khalil, I've not known as long as the Toms, but when I first brought this event 
to, to Dave Van Slyke's attention and asked him, who do you think I should have as the third panelist? I wanted a professor who was an historian objective and could look at the past with a desire to inform the future. Dave Van Slyke's first suggestion was Professor Kilil. You might be happy to know that. So ask for a raise next week. Um, <laughs> Professor Khalil is the author of two books, United States Relations with China and Iran, and America's Dream Palace, Middle East Expertise and the Rise of the National Security State. The latter book won the best book of 2017 prize from the uh, Foreign Affairs magazine. So that, that, I don't really know what that is, but that sounds awesome, um, <laughs> and it's very impressive. And so here's our concept of operations for this evening. Um, we're going to do this conversation style. I'll ask some questions, uh, but I will not use my questions to interrupt good answers. I'm not going to ask the same question of each person, so it's not going to be dot, 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 dot. Um, and we're not going to do speech question, answers. We're just going to do conversational. Uh, we're then going to open it up to the audience for questions about, um, after about 30 minutes. Um, the rule on audience questions is no speech questions, just questions, right? We, we, we have a great uh, opportunity to hear from this panel, um, and that's who we'd like to hear from. Um, and I'm not a Ron expert, I'm a judge, and I know how to gavel someone quiet. Uh, so that's what I will do if there's a speech question. So with that, uh, I'm going to sit down and we're going to get started. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Um, well, so first, thanks for being here. <laughs> uh, Tom Pickering, I was wondering if I could start with you and ask if you could characterize the current state of U.S.-Iran relations for our audience. Describe some of the pressure points and flashpoints as well, if you would. Thank you, Jamie, very much, and thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with two other distinguished panelists and yourself. Uh, I would say the U.S.-Iranian relationship is bad and could get worse, <laughs> but with a small sense that uh, a president who, like a stop clock, is right sometimes twice a day, uh, is now reaching out for a personal meeting. And a personal meeting is an unusual event. He hasn't shown a great capacity to make maximum use of those, but it is something that has perhaps broken along with the reaction of the Saudis and the United States uh, to the attack against the Saudi uh, oil production facilities at Abqaiq and a uh, Saudi oil field. Um, we were in, uh, still are, in a position where we are putting on maximum pressure, sanctions after sanctions, and shutting down even the permissive loopholes that existed in the oil sanctions, while at the same time, Iran is escalating on two ladders. One, the nuclear ladder, moving away from its commitments on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, both with respect to the quantity of enrichment uh, and the level of enrichment, which are things which, in one way or another, put them closer to reducing quite dramatically the one-year time limit that was the gold standard for the agreement, while at the same time they are taking military action. And while there is a certain aura of uncertainty, I think it is a small aura of uncertainty about uh, tanker bombings, uh, about drone shootdowns quite clearly, whether it was in or out of Iranian airspace is an argument. Uh, and quite clearly, uh, the government reaction to, <coughs> the US government reaction to the drone and cruise missile strikes is it came from the Northeast. And we know where the Northeast is from the targets. So we are, uh, just to summarize very quickly at the end, in a position where should these actions continue, I remain in a deep sense of concern that they will lead to a tit-for-tat strike, counter-strike activity, uh, and that the pressures will continue to go on. And I'm firmly of the belief that 
This puts us in a situation that I call the bluff trap. Continued pressures, action and reaction from both sides has only two outcomes. One is there is a back down or there is war. And in my view, what this needs to have happen to it is to shape it toward a diplomatic encounter again, where in fact the pressures can be one, to get to the table, but two, then to work on the shape of the outcome of the agreements at the table. The president has mooted that, and President Macron has started it, uh, and President Macron overreached with a grandiose four-point plan, but a slimmed-down version of that unilaterally done by both sides. On the U.S. side, waiving the sanctions on oil exports for the eight countries that previously received it, and on the Iranian side, no more increases in nuclear violations and a retraction of at least one or two on a unilateral basis could set the stage for a meeting. And President Macron has at least established a basis for an agenda for in a meeting, something the president doesn't normally enjoy having, but which could lead off to a process. Now, I would say this little ounce of bright hope is just at this stage um, a conceptual possibility, and there may be others, but I think it's important. The Europeans and the U.S. Uh, and the Iranians should work on it, and we have mutual incentives, I believe, uh, to make that happen. Uh, any comment, additions to that? We're going to return to the state of relations in a moment. We're just setting the table here. That's an hors d'oeuvre. Um, <laughs> Khalil, anything to add to that? No, I, I, I think what I would, I think Ambassador Pickering has summed it up very well, and I would agree with, I would agree with his assessment. I think the only thing I will throw out is that if the, the attack on the Saudi oil refinery showed anything, is that the, the stakes are very high from a, uh, for very low cost, whether it was the Houthis or it was uh, an Iranian strike themselves, the stakes are very high for the global economy, and it's demonstrated at a very low cost to them that they can inflict a massive amount of damage very quickly. Um, so I think it's, it's, diplomacy is perhaps really the only track left. We've tried a number of other tracks. Uh, war itself will be extremely costly, and we can come back to that uh, over time. Yeah. Uh, and, and we will. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for that. But um, Osama, uh, could you give our audience, this is going to be hard to do and test your uh, capacity <laughs> for synthesis, but can you give our audience a sense of um, how we got to this point, and if you're an American student or a casual <laughs> observer of U.S.-Iran relations, you know two dates, 1953 and 1979, and that tends to be all you know. Um, please comment. Uh, so, <laughs> in three minutes in three or minutes? less. <laughs> sure. Uh, I've got my work out for me. Has everybody had their coffee is the big question. So mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things is uh, to think about when we think about U.S.-Iranian relations is to step back from 53 and 79. So the 53 coup or the 79 revolution. And realize that there is a much longer spread of U.S. interactions with Iran that predates the 53 coup and goes well beyond 79. Obviously, we wouldn't be talking about a nuclear agreement um, and the negotiations and tensions between the United States and Iran that go well beyond uh, and well after the, the 79 revolution. I think one of the things to think about is, is perhaps to look at one through a Cold War lens and then a post-Cold War lens. Um, and part of that influences, at least from most historians, so here I'm speaking as a historian, uh, influences why there was a coup in 53. Why did the United States view the Mossadegh government in Iran as such a threat? Why did certain, uh, uh, certain elements within Iran it's themselves reach out to the United States and say, uh, we would like to remove Mossadegh? So I think one of the things we need to think about is what, what role did Iran play for the United States as part of the Cold War, especially in the early Cold War period? And one of the things that's often kind of not understood is it was an initial trigger line for the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan. Right? Uh, Iran was immensely important, particularly for Great Britain and for Western Europe, in terms of the rebuilding of Western Europe. Most students forget now that the United States was a net oil exporter until the 1970s. The oil that was coming from Iran and the largest refinery in the world at that point, in Abadan, was intended for Western Europe to a lesser extent Japan. 
the largest single expenditure for the Marshall Plan was on oil from the Middle East, particularly for Iran. So for the United States, this is going to be a key element. For Great, for Great Britain, it has an economic as well as a political perspective. And this is why the Mossadegh government itself, the fears of nationalization, the fears, even if they didn't believe that Mossadegh himself was a communist, the fear that he was an unstable ruler or could not be trusted, also lends itself to why the Eisenhower administration decides finally uh, to, to agree to an, a coup. Now, I think one of the things we should probably mention uh, from a historian's perspective, I know there have been a number of discussions about this, is to what extent was the United States involved? Uh, as Thomas here, and, and we can come back to this, the CIA denied it for a number of years with a wink and a smile, but they finally admitted it. And in fact, you know, we held a conference at Syracuse a few years back looking at some of the declassified documents. And so there really isn't much of a mystery behind it. One of the questions is, what does 53 mean now? What did it mean to the 79 revolution? Um, I think there's no mistaking that probably for historians it's a more important issue than perhaps it is for Iranians in Iran today who have far more uh, relevant issues to deal with. It has been used as a political tool by the regime. Uh, there's no denying that. And one of the ways it's used, and it's one of the things that we talk about in, in one of my book, that uh, the editor volume that Jamie mentioned, is the fact that the regime says, when it comes to the nuclear agreement, things like, look, Mossadegh, tried to negotiate. Mossadegh tried to reason with the United States, and that failed, and they overthrew him. So they'll use it as a historic lesson in a way that we don't, particularly for the United States, doesn't want. So I think that's one thing to think about when we look at how histo history can, can be weaponized. I think for the case of the revolution, there's also a question of how important was 53 to the revolution? And that's another factor. Um, at least for nationalists within Iran, remember the, the Iranian revolution itself in 79 was not a Islamic revolution at first. It was a broad-based uprising against the Shah's rule. It became an Islamic revolution fairly quickly. They were the most organized group. They were also the group that was the least repressed by the Shah. And that came back to bite him in a number of different ways. Uh, but I think it's one of these things where, in fact, during some of the protests, pictures of Mossadegh, this deposed prime minister who was held under house arrest, were held by a number of individuals. The National Front, which was his party, which was his broad coalition becomes this interim government that's effectively overthrown. So the 53 coup does have a number of roots in Iran and is, is remembered in a number of different ways, some which are not favorable to the United States and some which are not favorable, quite frankly, to Iran. Um, okay, thank you. <coughs> so, uh, additions, comments on that? Just Please. very briefly, I think since the nuclear question has been the centerpiece of American relations with Iran, it's possible <coughs> to <coughs> limb out very quickly the development of the Iranian nuclear program. It began under the Shah, atoms for peace. We built a reactor in Tehran, <coughs> a small research reactor. <coughs> the program ended at the time of the revolution, although Iraqi use in the eight-year war of gas weapons, nerve gas, promoted the, uh, the Iranian interest in the question. After the war, it began, ostensibly as a peaceful program. The Shah had in mind 22 reactors making electricity. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, most of us who were following the program <coughs> thought that the uh, Shaw pretty much had weapons in mind. It was certainly not something you could dissolve. <laughs> As the Iranians developed the program, the Europeans started a negotiation to stop it. In 2003, there was a two-year standstill in centrifuge activity. Um, America never attended those meetings, but was behind the scenes the most important influence. The United States said, that <coughs> the Iranian expectation that for good behavior for two years they would be free to do what they wanted was not on, and that stopped. We believe, according to our intelligence community, that they had a weapons program then. It stopped in 2007 for reasons that are still not 100% clear. The U.S. joined the negotiations at the end of 2012 those particular negotiations were succeeded by an Obama administration effort to open confidential conversations through mainly Oman. 
Those negotiations began in the middle of 2012 <coughs> and led to two agreements, one in 2013 in November, a partial agreement which stopped some activities of Iran and reduced some but very little of American sanctions activities, and a full agreement in 2015. I participated in track two conversations with the Iranians beginning in 2002. Uh, explain track two, please. Track two is essentially non-official representatives of a country meeting together to talk about problems between the countries in a confidential setting, but not totally top secret. Uh, the Iranians who came were partly government people, and some maybe more government than not government. Uh, that continues, and we had a meeting uh, recently. That particular set of activities led us to believe that it would be very hard to get a nuclear agreement. At the end, most of us who were involved in that believed the nuclear agreement was well beyond what we thought the United States could achieve. So I, that I, nuclear agreement we violated by walking away from in May of what, 2018. So I, I, I would just add to, to that a great statement, <coughs> a couple of things. One is, I think one thing that's often forgotten is that Iran is a party to the, uh, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Agreement. Um, Iran does deny that they have a nuclear weapons program and have said that they will never develop a nuclear weapon. Now, whether we want to take that at face value or not, there is evidence that they have been cheating. There's evidence that they've cheated on the NPT, but they've also opened themselves up to inspectors and would have and did under uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan. So I, one of the questions is, and, and this is one of the arguments that I think we can, we can talk about and we can move into in, in, when we go into Q&A, is the president claimed in walking away from the, the agreement that was negotiated by the Obama administration, and to Ambassador Pickering's point, very few thought that that was going to be achievable, was that he could get a better deal. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, with what's being presented, and, and Ambassador Pickering talked about, uh, even with the Macron plan, that this will not be any better than the JCPOA. And so one question is, if you were Iran, why would you now come back to the table? Is it because of sanctions? Is it because, quite frankly, what you really want, and, and there are some Iranian experts who would argue this, uh, that you didn't really expect better relations with the United States, but what you're hoping for is by removing the nuclear issue off the table, you can have better relations with Europe and definitely with Russia and China. And that's really what they're after. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to policy red lines and goals in a moment, but first I want to return to the historical thread by asking Tom Ahern, uh, what are some of the lessons you've learned from studying the history of U.S.-Iran relations? Um, you can start in 1953 or go back further, um, and you can dwell as much or as little as you'd like on 1979. Um, but what are some of the lessons you've, de you've derived in your study of the past? <clears throat> to me, there's one theme that runs through almost all the work I've done uh, in my retirement, uh, just by accident of, of the choice of, of topics, but uh, the, the two three principal ones, I guess, are, are Iran, Iraq, and Vietnam. And the, the principal uh, thing that, the, the, that my uh, researchers have led me to uh, is the, uh, the uh, Tendency to, uh, that we've just, well, just to, just to put, put it a uh, uh, little more uh, broadly, the uh, conviction that is so often displayed that uh, we can do pretty much wh uh, what we want, uh, that uh, we could handle the uh, well, uh, I ain't getting off to the right to the right start here exactly, uh, because I wanted what I, what I really wanted to uh, start with is the uh, uh, preoccupation, if if not obsession, with uh, the uh, the existential threat posed by 
posed by the communists, or by the Soviet, Soviet and then the uh, uh, Chinese communists. Uh, that and our confidence that we, uh, it's a parallel thing, uh, the confidence that we can uh, build a world that is, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't entirely accept uh, the United States as a political model, that at least it's, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're compatible. Uh, We didn't do that in any, in, in none of the three places uh, that I mentioned uh, did we do that uh, in uh, in uh, Vietnam. We s selected a president, uh, a, uh, an emigre from uh, from Vietnam, uh, and when that didn't work, uh, we. Uh, uh, supported and endorsed uh, a military regime as well, actually as the as the only uh, the, the only alternative but one which was uh, a, a viable choice to uh, to uh, def to prevent the uh, North Vietnamese uh, uh, absorption of the south uh, in Iraq, we were going to establish in the in the uh, formulation of the uh, uh, what were called the the Vulcans uh, in the uh, in the Bush the Bush administration. Uh, we were going to establish the first Arab democracy, one that would. Uh, would be would would prove itself uh, worthy of, uh, of of our support by the fact that it was uh, disposed to accept our guidance. Uh, this, by the way, is a theme that runs through uh, all of these things: is the uh, notion that you can have a uh, genuinely a genuinely independent in a, and and. Uh, Uh, a completely functioning, a genuinely autonomous uh, nation state, a, de a democracy, uh, and <clears throat> be confident that is, it will always do what, what you want it to do, at least in, in, matter, in you know, matters of key importance that uh, you can be fairly confident that you, your, your will will prevail. Uh, and the uh, and again this, the uh, the uh, in uh, in, in Iran uh, now uh, we had a similar situation in that uh, we knew when we installed the Shah in. But re reinstalled the Shah in 1953, uh, that he was indeed a a weak reed. It's, it appears to me that we proceeded with this anyway for well at least two reasons. One is that we were. One is, uh, as I say, well, a theme that runs through all our, our, our adventures in these in these areas uh, was that there wasn't anybody else. The uh, a, a, uh, the uh, this serving as a basis for 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 choices uh, that seemed to the people making them to to justify uh, uh, justify this uh, a, a more or less unconditional commitment to people whose uh, ability to uh, serve our interests or or their own. Uh, was was very questionable, uh, and so that generally is 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 my uh, is my takeaway fr from uh, 
uh, a long period of service in, uh, in client countries uh, that uh, eventually, uh, whose leadership uh, installed and, and supported by us, uh, the countries that eventually disappointed us rather bitterly. Do you, uh, Khalil brought up the Cold War, you brought up uh, anti-communism as well. Were we clouded by our, so focused on the anti-communist mission, the Soviet mission, that we lost sight of what we were doing <coughs> with the Shah? Or did we just accept that as the cost of being anti-communist? Well, I, I think one of, the, one of the, as I was trying to hint at earlier, one of the problems of emphasizing 53 so much is that from a historian's perspective, when we look at some of the debates that went on after the Shah was reinstalled to Tom's point, so one of the that's forgotten is that the Shah maintains great relations with a number of different presidents. But behind the scenes, so whether it's the rest of the Eisenhower administration, LBJ, Nixon, Ford, and then finally with Carter, behind the scenes, and in between he has a, a fairly tough relationship with Kennedy, uh, behind the scenes there is a vigorous debate within the State Department, to Tom's point, which is there's a question about who, who can we get instead of him. So there are constant warnings within the State Department about that the Shah is not popular, that the Shah has a number of corrupt advisors around him, that there needs to be modernization and reform, or by the 70s, the Shah is overspending dramatically on weapons. Uh, he's spending all of this money that's coming in. We need to do something. When he was running a ruthless intelligence program with Savak that obviously made people that freed and fearful and, and, and unwilling to go ahead. I don't think it was necessarily the totally unmitigated disaster, but uh, clearly moving Mossadegh was a key point that everybody was able to point to. And having tried to keep it confidential under the wonderful doctrine of plausible denial was in a way uh, uh, an affirmation of self-guilt that it led us to be, in one way or another, a, a partisan of a, a difficult activity. Uh, I visited Iran with King Hussein in the beginning of 1979. And he came back from that meeting. I did not meet the Shah. Jimmy Carter and Zbig ha had meetings uh, with the Jordanians as a sidebar. <laughs> But he told me he spent a lot of time with the Shah, who he admired, and said the Shah is completely out of touch. He does not know what's going on in his own country, and it is a dangerous situation. And dutifully, I reported that in a very secure channel to Washington. And obviously, it was a number of pieces of paper on a pile, which was blithely ignored, partly because the alternative was not obvious as to what could be done in that situation. Um, and obviously there were currents moving against him, as you, I think, Osama pointed out very clearly in, in where we're going. So U.S.-Iranian relations, which had some bright spots in the 19th and early 20th century in terms of the U.S missionaries and others promoting change. And we played a major role in getting the Soviet Union out of the northern portion of Iran in the period right after the Second World War, where they were lodged quite firmly in. Uh, and it was one of the remarkable pushbacks that actually worked with Stalin. But it gave everybody a sense that there was a live Communist Party today uh, in Iran that we had to worry about. And I think the communist boogeyman or the communist bugbear, not an irrelevant question, but constantly was overrated in the Cold War conflict we were engaged in. I lived through a lot of that. I observed a lot of it, and I saw a lot of it. And I think Tom Ahern is right. It uh, shaped our views as to how and what way to deal with Iran. We are now in a reverse situation. We are in a situation where the large majority of Americans, including on the coast, believe that Iran is an unreconcilable enemy that can never be dealt with, 
and that we have adopted perforce an attitude of demonization, similar in many ways to what we do with Russia and which is growing with China. And this is not a policy and it is not a way to work. Um, and no less august a person than Yitzhak Rabin constantly said two things to me. You got to talk to your enemies, which he said in public, and he said in private to me in the late 1980s in a numerous set of meetings, you guys have got to open a channel to the Iranians. It's extremely important for us in this country, Israel, that we do that. That's an example of someone who's thinking in many ways involved the strategic question. So we now face the strategic question that I think is real. Is our next step war is or is our next step moving ahead? And I think there are things that we can do to move ahead despite the fact that we have an unproven negotiator at the top whose weaknesses I think are reflected remarkably in where we are with the North Koreans, for example, but who craves attention that somehow can be helpful in beginning to reestablish a contact. And my sense from Iranians that I talk to is the pressure is on and it is significant. And the demonstrations are only one aspect of this. And they would like to see some kind of opening in a diplomatic context that they can move with, but they totally distrust the man who is in one way or another in charge in this country, and we have to find a way to build trust before we can build agreements. Um, we're gonna turn to audience questions, so this is a warning. Um, I will be, feel quite comfortable calling on you uh, if you don't call on us first. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, um, I'm going to ask uh, that we return to the bluff trap. Uh, in a way, Jim Mattis and others have suggested that the United States has made a mistake by not responding in a military fashion to such provocations as the Cafo Milano bomb plot, the shoot down of the drone that you mentioned, Tom Pickering, uh, the missile attack in Saudi Arabia. Um, You've presented the bluff trap as diplomacy or war. I think Jim Mattis is suggesting that we get, and, and I'm not embracing this position one way or the other, I'm using it as a prompt, that the absence of a military response to such provocations has emboldened Iran. Let me deal with that if I can, because I have the greatest respect for General Mattis and have had the time over the years to talk to him about Iran. Uh, and I think, um, the notion that we engage in tit-for-tat exchanges without having a way to use those to shape an agreement, or at least to try, is what I call the bluff trap. And my feeling is what makes the use of military and economic pressure useful for diplomacy is the fact that it is combined with an effort to have communications and that people in the United States who feel that somehow we're rewarding an enemy uh, by having communications with them have completely lost their sense of moving. I do not think another war in the Middle East, I agree with President Trump a thousand percent, makes any sense. I think getting out of the ones that we have are not walk away propositions, but we should have a strategy for doing so. And President Trump broke the agreement with Iran with the statement about making a better deal and we have no scintilla of evidence that he has ever thought about, much less proposed a better deal of any kind at all except to accommodate, to accumulate the complaints he had about the deal was not broad enough and not, not sweeping enough to include ballistic missiles and obviously Iranian misbehavior in a number of countries, which we have always objected to. Uh, but my feeling is that um, the Obama administration was 100% right in negotiating on nuclear alone. That if we had a broader deal, we would have paid for it by dumbing down the nuclear restraints we are able to get in this deal. 
And I think the Iranians, interestingly enough, wanted a nuclear deal alone at the end. They had been in favor of a broader agreement because they were being squeezed economically, mostly by oil price declines and partly by Ahmadinejad's screw up of their economy and partly, but not exclusively, by our sanctions. That's another chimera that our sanctions did it all that we should divorce from our, our, our thinking as being unrealistic. Tom Ahern, do you care to respond or add to the, the Mattis proposition? Or are you in the Pickering camp? <laughs> <laughs> the bad guys. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, but from uh, all I know is what I read in the papers, right? Uh, it does seem to me that the the uh, the, the Mattis position c c kind of leaves out uh, any explanation of how this is going to uh, how you get uh, gonna, uh, how this is going to improve our position. Mm -hmm. Feel good, but do nothing. It feel make us feel good. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's good for military budgets yeah. too. Yeah. Well, if I, if I well, he's, yeah. he's presumably uh, immune to that. No, no. But, no he once happened. said, if you don't if you don't appropriate money to the State Department, he's got to get more ammunition. <laughs> so he he thinks about budgets. Uh, just as a historian, I, I'll, I'll remind the audience that the war in Afghanistan is entering its has just passed its 18th year. 18th year, right? The war in Yemen, where you went from having the Houthis mm -hmm. as a rebel militia, right, is now a certified resistance group, and that's entering its fifth year. The war in Libya shows no way of ending. The war in Syria may be dying down, it may not be. Iraq is still, after many years of a US occupation, ISIS is re-emerging, in part because of Turkey's intervention again in, uh, in Syria, but also because Ir ISIS never really went away in, in Iraq. So Iraq is still a mess. To add Iran to the list on top of this, and, and, and Tom had mentioned the Vulcans under the Bush administration, the so-called Vulcans. Hmm. Um, this never shaped the way it was supposed to shape, this intervention in Iraq. In fact, it was the, everybody who warned about the intervention was proven correct. Uh, and yet, we still see this effort and this attempt to kind of find a military solution to every problem. And I think Ambassador Picking's right, that at, we should at least try diplomacy once. It may actually work. Uh, okay, questions, <laughs> questions from the audience, please. Um, please, and if you could state who you are. Uh, you don't have to give a long biography, but... Uh, I'm Rajan Gill, Maxwell alum. Um, thank you so much. This is a topic I'm really interested in. I uh, was surprised not to hear Saudi Arabia mentioned. Uh, wanted to know if yeah. any of you could comment <laughs> on um, this, uh, you know, the current leader of Saudi, MBS, is, is clearly very anti-Iran and has a very unconventional line of communication with this administration over WhatsApp and whatnot. Um, how much has his neurosis about Iran kind of uh, guided the current uh, decision to walk away from the deal? Perhaps I could take a whack, but others could jump in. I did mention Saudi Arabia in terms of the Iranian raid. Um, and I think that that's had a very, put it this way, interesting influence. Neither the Saudis nor the US in fact, embraced the idea of a Mattis return blow. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that will continue forever. That's what I worry about. But I think it is interesting that shortly before that, we saw the United Arab Emirates begin to withdraw from Yemen, uh, politically and militarily. And shortly after that, we saw a Yemeni meeting uh, between the government and the Houthis sponsored or at least patronized by Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia that began the beginning of a ceasefire proposal. How effective that will be as a first stage is not clear, but it's interesting. It is also interesting that there clearly have been track two conversations between Iranians and Saudis and which uh, both have had track one participants, that is, the individuals who had high office in their states, looking presumably to moving. These are very important because if, in fact, the future of the Gulf 
Persian or Arab you choose, is to be the cockpit of future conflict, uh, we all lose and nobody gains. And it is an important effort to move to try to develop a relationship that has some stability to it in a strategic sense, that has some balance. Nobody wins and nobody loses. Currently, the struggle is over each side not wanting the other to become the hegemon. Not that they have lack of pretense themselves, but each side, I think, is beginning to realize that this is a not on proposition and that frustration which often occurs uh, in the period of long wars, about year five, is set in in a way that I think has brought some little a kind of evidence of clarity and, and celerity to the way people are thinking in the region. The fascinating thing is we are not in it. The one country outside the Middle East who can talk to everybody is Russia, Putin. It is crazy that we should be, in fact, walking away from the Middle East diplomatically when we're trying to end the conflicts, which can only end, in my humble view, diplomatically. They are not really winnable in a, in a, in a, in a sense that we have traditionally looked at it in World War II terms. Check. If I could um, add something real quick. To sure, just and then we'll go so, to the uh, question right here. Bin Salman has, at this point, it's pretty clear, has a reverse Midas touch, right? Yep. Almost everything he touches turns to something else, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I think um, one of the things to think about is that was revealed is not just, if some of you may remember, the war in Yemen did not start under, the Trump administration started under Obama. And this was supposed to be a quick war. In fact, it's, and this was his war. This was Bin Salman's war. It's turned out the exact opposite. And we're finally seeing, after a period of repression inside Saudi Arabia, our grumblings that are leaking out, especially after the missile attack uh, on the Saudi refineries, that this never should have happened. So you're actually starting to see some questions being raised about his leadership finally after, one, trying to isolate Qatar and failing, kidnapping the Lebanese prime minister and failing, trying to, trying to defeat Yemen and failing, trying to uh, win in Syria and failing, trying to do something with ISIS and failing. So over and over again, you've had a series of failures, including in Libya. Trying bone saws and failing. Everything. Murdering journalists and failing. So it's, uh, there may finally be some rationality returning in Riyadh, at least to his rule, or at least a, a, leveling, a leveling head. A question here, please. Good evening. So my name is Crochelle Harris. I'm actually a Foreign Service Officer with USAID. Most of the countries that we're talking about, with the exception of Iran, I've had some work in or with. Um, I like that you talk about what can we do diplomatically, but please don't forget what can we do in development as well, because I still show up every day at work with the hope that somehow either our development programs or our diplomatic policy will do something that makes some difference. We at the country, when we're working on these countries, we are talking about strategies at our sort of lower levels, but we don't always see those conversations bubble up. So I would hate to leave here feeling like my work is futile. So what I would like to hear, especially from either a sort of academic perspective or from you, Ambassador Pickering, or even from, you know, because I have colleagues in your cone as well when we are working in embassies. Mm -hmm. What do we kind of do when we are sitting in a country where we know that we are asked to come up with country level strategies or plans, but we're not really sure where they're going to make it once they sort kind of come back to Washington? I hope this isn't the kind of question where you said you'd sort of shut the gavel. Well, you're getting it. close to the I gavel. Know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank you. The usual trick is to raise your voice at the end in an inflection yeah. point, but. Yeah. Well, since I was mentioned in dispatches, let me start yes. and say that if we take the area of the Arab Mashrik uh, and the Gulf, uh, clearly Yemen, Jordan, Lebanon, I'll leave Israel aside because that's obviously a special case, uh, Iraq, 
and Syria are all places where in one fashion or another uh, U.S. assistance is required because they are not the oily countries of the Middle East. My old friend Shimon Peres said there were holy countries and oily countries. <laughs> and you know which are which. Uh, and in each case, there are refugee problems, there are disturbances of war and conflict in some of them. Uh, there are enormous burdens to be carried by the donor community and particularly the U.S. And the fact that we in part have opted out of diplomacy uh, and the budgets we submit cutting radically aid are reversed by the American Congress, which has finally stepped up uh, to the radical destruction of the foreign aid budget by asserting its own influence in foreign policy in a constructive way. And we don't say enough nice about the Congress in this and restored that money is very important to go ahead. And so I think those are all there. One would like to see a program in Iran, but we haven't had it. But we offered Iran assistance for the Baman earthquake damage, uh, and that was accepted, and, and, it, and it made, I think, a difference. Having visited Iran once in the last 20 years, the most interesting question I found on the street from Iranians is why isn't our relationship with you better? And it's really interesting. They're mystified in many ways, partly, I guess, because they turn off the internet, partly because they get a feed of information that's less open to what we consider to be reliable, truthful information. But those are all part of the nexus of the issue that your very good question raised. How can US positive influence be exerted in a conflicted and very difficult and challenging region. Okay, Khalil, if I, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Tom, if you want to go. No, go, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of the things that we often emphasize at Maxwell is discussions about soft power and hard power. And I think what you've heard over and over again is the need to return to soft power. And development assistance is a piece of that. But I think even if we just look at, as Ambassador Pickering mentioned, the issue of refugees, right? Um, one of the problems over the past decade has been that it's, especially in the Middle East, when we look at the situation of Syrian refugees, it's that's the poorest countries in the region that have been asked to bear the heaviest burden. For instance, UNH, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, none of their appeals on Syria have ever even come close to meeting their goals. And yet, when we continue looking at a military solution, this is one of the other aspects of diplomacy versus uh, the military solution, the, the cost that's involved with any kind of military effort far exceeds the development budget, over and over again. And it's often at the expense of development. And it's often, when you're dealing with refugees after destructions of homes, et cetera, it makes it even more difficult to do anything in the way of vocational training, education, health, et cetera. So this com almost completely negates any attempt to do good on the ground by the continuous emphasis on hard power. You know, uh, Osama, your point about the cost is clear. Hundreds of times, the cost of a diplomatic effort is what it takes just to get our side involved. And then when you think of having to pick up the pieces of all the destruction and displacement and the human damage uh, through conflict, obviously, uh, if you're an economist and a budget analyst, you should be thinking very, very carefully about jumping in and, and getting yourselves in a position where you're on an escalatory ladder up the scale of using military force. Uh, I mean, it is, it is in that sense uh, a council beyond humanitarian, which is the fundamental council, but it is a council that has drained the U.S. Treasury of trillions of dollars over the 18 and 17 year wars we've been involved in. Treasury and blood. And, and, and I don't blood, want to make yeah. this a two-way discussion, but yeah. I think if we could just name two cities and you want to think about when, if ever, they will be rebuilt. Mm. One is Mosul and one is Raqqa. Raqqa. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the Turkish intervention back into northern Syria mm. right, has a direct implication. Because if ISIS is re-emerging, which we believe it is, and we've seen evidence of this throughout, throughout Iraq, right, especially in, in the border areas and in the center of Iraq, what about the rebuilding of Mosul? When does that happen? Who does that? When is Raqqa rebuilt? If the United States is not going to have some, and we generally don't want to have an engagement with the Bashar al-Assad regime. Someone has to rebuild that town, or else we're just looking at another issue within a few years. Either we rely on the Chinese and the Russians to rebuild it, or we start 
quite frankly, becoming adults about this, and we started dealing with, dealing with it diplomatically. <coughs> uh, <coughs> oh, great. We have additional questions, please. Right here. Okay. Uh, yeah. My name is Arnie Podgorski. So, I attended. Uh, just, um, we have a lot of questions in the audience, so now we're going to rapid fire round. Rapid fire. Um, mm -hmm. Or uh, more on the diplomatic side than the military, yeah. but still rapid fire, please. I'll try and make it a rapid fire question. I went to the law school, which may account for what's perhaps the naivete of the question. I'm with that person in the street in, in Iran, um, having difficulty understanding what is the beef that's driving this dangerous dispute. I understood what the dispute was with the USSR. With Iran, is it that there's so much causticity that it's a vicious circle? Or is it religious fervor in the revolution, which seems to be their own internal issue and not ours? What is okay. at the heart of this that in all of that diplomacy that's being suggested, we could address? Fair enough. What's, what, what's at the root and the heart of this dispute between Iran. First of all, I ask Tom, do you want to take a, sh a stab at that or not? Well, as you know, my, uh, my, my, my mindset is, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the past. I tend to be stuck in the past. Uh, all my work has, has uh, been in that area. Uh, but I, 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 th I think probably the, the essential thing is not to be looking for some unitary <coughs> explanation for this. Uh, uh, different constituencies having, having uh, d different, uh, well, different perceptions, I interests, uh, loyalties, and so forth. Uh, the th thing I find interesting is, is uh, the difficulty I have from my admittedly shallow reading on a subject uh, is that uh, it it's, seems to me it's hard to tell uh, which, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the mentality of the of the, of the of the rural population, the students, and so forth, the different uh, the, you know the middle class. Uh, I see different interpretations of what the, what that means in terms of the of their respective degree of support for the for the regime. And uh, in other words, I'm suggesting it's an intelligence question. Quick response, Khalil and Tom. I mean, I can I can. Uh it's multifaceted. I think Tom, Tom has hit on this. Um, one of the issues is, I, I, would, I would lend away from this idea of religious fervor, right? Uh, in part, you, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear I said, it. I, would, I, would lend, I would take it away from this idea of religious fervor, that that's what's behind this, right? I mean, the regime has had relations with the United States on and off. I think for some of you who are old enough to remember, during the Iran-Iraq war period, the United States was secretly dealing weapons to Iran in part to release hostages from Lebanon, but also this idea that they could appeal to moderates within the regime. There's no denying that it's an oppressive regime. It is an oppressive regime, but so is China. Right? We have relations with a number of oppressive regimes. We have relations with Russia. The idea is what do we want out of this, out of this relationship? Do we want a relationship? Right? Is there a way to bring some kind of stability to the region, or do we just believe, in, in this case the Persian Gulf, or do we just believe that by blockading isolating, applying sanctions, that the regime itself will fall. That's not going to happen. It hasn't happened ever. Uh, so in this case, sanctions don't really work. So, so uh, what about the uh, nuclear Iran? Is that not a, a fundamental impediment? Well, I, here's the question. I, you know, we had a nuclear deal, which the United States walked away from. Iran did not walk away from mm -hmm. it, right? From, from all accounts, they were generally in compliance. So we had a deal. Ambassador Pickering has pointed out that another deal may be possible. It may not be better, but another deal may be possible. Uh, what I would argue is that from Iran's perspective, right, is an Iranian bomb any more or less dangerous than a Pakistani bomb or an, or an Indian bomb, right? Iran says they are not trying to develop nuclear weapons. We had an arrangement that would have prevented them from getting nuclear weapons, and we walked away from it. Okay, I'm, that's on me, the extra time. Okay, uh, boy, we got a lot of questions. So question here, and then we'll work our way back. We're, oh, right here in front, sorry, then you're next. I don't, I don't or you can do it in a combo pack and speak oh. at one, together, no. Oh. All right, I, I don't need a microphone. I just want, I'm, I, hmm? do I have to do something? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I'm Nancy Ely-Rafel. 
an undergraduate from the Maxwell School. And, question, and an ambassador, so please. And, and my question to some of the members of the panel, why, why do you keep calling it a regime? So the question is, why do you keep calling it a regime? Well, let me answer that, Nancy, because I'm trying to avoid <laughs> calling it a regime because I know your proclivities on this subject. Um, <laughs> he, did, he, did, he did not warn me about that. No, <laughs> I did not. And my sense is that it is part of the demonology that uh, governments we don't like are always regimes. Uh, and therefore, you can count it in the course of, put it this way, um, self-directed prejudice that has played that role, and, and so we don't call the Queen of England a regime. You may not. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we will now, and we'll quote now, Tom Pickering as and, the source. And, 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 it, and it hasn't gotten, it hasn't gotten uh, the, the, the kind of currency that other, other names have. So, but I think it's quite simply that, and I, and I think your, your question is, is based on the notion, does it prejudice people's views about Iran? Of course it does. Is it wrong to think that Iran has made mistakes? No. Is it wrong to think that the US has made mistakes? Of course. You go to an Iranian, there's a long list. We shot down a civil airplane. Uh, we blew up their uh, oil platforms. They mined the Persian Gulf. Uh, we can go on and on. They imprisoned our people for 444 days. Uh, they have supported people we don't like around the world who we consider to be terrorists. They consider to be freedom fighters. The truth, of course, is that no difference with a foreign country has ever been solved, in my view, by reconciling the differences over the history of the past. They are all worked out on the basis of how can we coordinate our future behavior to get out of the cycle of crap that has in fact characterized the past in large measure as a result of misperceptions, misunderstandings, mistakes, and accidents. You've done a good job of accidents. hijacking the question, but <laughs> okay. uh, point well taken. Uh, so that's the answer to the regime right here, and then we're going to bounce back over there. Hi, uh, Paige Gisner. Um, I think we're all pretty comfortable with the own nuances of our own political system, but I think there's a tendency to look at the other as a monolithic entity. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities there are within the Iranian uh, political system. I think Khalil, that's probably yours. Yeah. Is that on me? Yeah. So no, it's okay. I think um, I think it's a good question. I th there are there are two tendencies of thought here, two, two strains of thought. On the one hand, there are those uh, Iranian experts who would say, look, since 2009, there really is, pardon the expression, an oppressive regime, right? There are no moderates left, right? Any of the moderates are in jail. There are others who say, quite frankly, that the, the nuclear agreement is a demonstration that there are moderates that can be dealt with and that it's really on the United States to really reach out to them and to demonstrate an even hand. Um, I think the fact that we can, we can object to the term regime if we want. I think some, there are not many people in this room who would probably want to live there. There is uh, more democratic governance in Iran than there, are in a num than, there are, than there is in Saudi Arabia or, quite frankly, most of the, of the rest of the Gulf. At the same time, there is a supreme religious leader who has the final say on almost everything. And without the, without the, agreeing, uh, without the agreement of the supreme religious leader, it's unclear that either moderates or hardliners have a lot of freedom of movement. So there, is some, there are some strands of hope, but it does require, from the United States perspective, to at least reach out a hand and not keep pulling it away. Uh, thank you. Uh, question over here, please. Uh, Megan Barnett, and a uh, question is, uh, do any of you believe that the creation of CENTCOM was an error? and that it exists and creates a boogeyman in order to continue to like, self-perpetuate, and that if you were king for a day, you might get rid of it. Well, I think that to the extent it enabled uh, the launching of a war against Iraq, for which I never found any justifiable reason, it was an aiding and abetting of a mistake and maybe an enabling of a mistake. I have reservations, too, about the Africa Command, 
I have reservations about the dominance of U.S. foreign policy by military thinking and by military action. And I speak often to military leadership about the necessity to contemplate how and in what way their activities can support diplomacy. And I get positive nods, but no reaction. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll throw this out. So one of the things when we think about the history of CENTCOM, it takes us right back to how it started, which was this was one of the, one of the pieces, the after effects of the Iranian revolution, right? The fact that, you know, we talk a lot about communism and, and, and the trigger for U.S. relations with Iran and with the Shah. What we've, what we've ignored is that through the 70s, in part because of the Vietnam War that, that Tom had talked about, the United States was relying on the Shah to be its regional policeman, right? Especially for the Persian Gulf. And the Shah was very happy to do that, right? The Shah bought immense quantities of, of hardware in order to do that. CENTCOM basically arises in part because of the Iranian Revolution, the hostage crisis, as well as the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The question then becomes, if you think about it, right, it's not really until after the Cold War when CENTCOM really gets used and is now being used and expanded upon. We go from a CENTCOM to AFRICOM. And the fact that we've, we've already touched on this, multiple conflicts. It's one thing to have a CENTCOM. It's another thing if you continue using CENTCOM and expanding the number of bases in and around that area. Um, working back this way, then we'll jump back and come back. Now we're going from rapid fire round to instantaneous round. Okay. You have to ask your question in fewer than 10 words. Excellent. <laughs> um, are we seeing the limits of Iranian asymmetric strategies in Iraq today with the protests? No. Oh, excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> No, I, and I think, I, just to throw, I think the attack on the Saudi refinery shows something, which is, and there's been some interesting writing about this, that if you think about how little that costs to do, yep. and the immense amount of damage compared to the cost, say, of an F-35, right, or the massive quantities that Saudi Arabia has spent on anti-missile defense, all of which failed, uh, I think asymmetric, the asymmetric uh, aspect is well alive. And in fact, some of this is coming up as we start looking at programs to fight killer drones. Right? Although, so, one interesting to think about, one thing to think about is the Saudis recovered in one week of Qaik because you just look at the price at the pump. It went up for three days. It's back around where it has been and maybe slightly down, depending upon the day of the week. So that, too, is very interesting. But the notion that America is in the process of backing away from its friends and allies is replete and is a very important consideration in the region and has put us in a position of, obviously, once again, sacrificing leadership, which we had accumulated over a long period of time and which was a very important part of a successful foreign policy. In the back, please. I, I notice you, but um, you have to wait till the merry-go-round comes around again to hop on. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, George Bush called both Iran and North Korea part of the axis of evil, and while we haven't had any progress with Iran, there was, even for a fleeting moment, some progress with North Korea. Is it too close to comparing apples to oranges, or could we reverse engineer what we had tried with North Korea and achieve some sort of progress with Iran the same way. Well, let me just address that. The fact that we achieved the joint comprehensive plan of action well after the axis of evil speech, speech uh, bespeaks a certain skepticism about the basis for your question. The fact that we have millennially advanced our capacity to stop the North Korean military program is also a huge overreach if that's the implication of your question. What we have stopped is two test programs, one of them in part missiles long range and the other nuclear weapons. Uh, and we have stopped exercises of some significance, although I think well worth it. What we failed to do in the Hanoi meeting was to take another step in the direction of what I would call stages of pressure and growth. We could have, I think, stopped their activities at a place called Yangbyon, where they were both enriching uranium and separating plutonium. Not entirely 
all of the activities that they were doing to make nuclear weapons fuel, but a step. And we could have paid for it with less than complete sanctions relief, although that's what Kim Jong-un demanded at the first round of negotiations and where diplomacy would have counseled us to say, we're not there yet, Mr. Un, but we can get there, and you have to understand that we're not going to buy uh, a, a horse for a rabbit. So I will, this takes us back to the question of language, right? So one of the implications, again, as a historian, the whole, one of the implications of the axis of evil speech was in fact that Iran was actually, when we talk about these relations, was actually coordinating with Washington, Washington against exactly. Al-Qaeda, yeah. right? Or as the president used to call them, Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a direct implication, right? Once that speech comes out and they're being lumped in, coordination ends. And this, of course, also plays in once the United States invades Iraq as well. So I think we also need to think about that, that language. We may not like the regime, but some of the language that's used, we can also find points of agreement with, even with regimes we don't like. Uh, other questions, please. So right here, and then you get the last question. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name's George Schieber. I, I used to be in the World Bank, and I've, I've been working in Iran since 98, actually. And the question I really have is I'd like to, if we can, dwell down a little bit on the political point you made, which is I think there was a lot of hope if you look at the demographics in Iran, the, the young populations, people wanting to be free, the women have frankly completely had it, with the covering up, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there was a lot of hope under Khatami and, and, and the previous uh, president, uh, not under Ahmadinejad, and Rouhani was another one. And yet, so the what question, we, please. What, we, what we've seen happen clearly is, is that the, the guards have gotten stronger. They control substantial elements of the economy. The other groups that were protesting were applying pressure seem to have been So muted. where are you going with your question? And my question please. really is, do you in, in, in the short run or even medium term see any hope for the democratic forces from the population to change sort of this very stronger militant view uh, held by the guard and the Supreme Council that you okay, can run thank elections? You. I'm going to hold that question. I'll just say no. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with that in the short term as well. Short term. I think that's going to be hard. Yeah. yeah. I think it's wow. Be hard. And in okay. the long term, we're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask as a last question, tell us something to be optimistic <laughs> yeah. about, but um, uh -huh. you've chilled that yeah. party. Yeah. Uh, please. Good evening, Andrew Mayer. Uh, I'm a former student of Peace Operations Training Institute, sir, of which you were on the board for some time. Uh, Dr. Harvey Langholtz, uh, and I did some research on advanced technologies in UN peacekeeping operations. So at what point does the development and military uh, come together to uh, uh, move us all past the atomic uh, Cold War boogeyman, as somebody pointed out earlier, and we start moving forward and thinking about uh, advanced energy resources to deflate uh, the aggression? Well, you got three questions all jumbled in there. Um, peacekeeping, uh, economic development, and new energy sources. And my sense is technology is very important in all of them, uh, and in many ways each of them is an instrument to help resolve uh, pressing problems in one way or another. And so I didn't mean jumbled in a sense that it wasn't a logical and I think useful question to look at if we see the overall effect of what you proposed. And that sense is that uh, it is increasingly true in my view in diplomacy that science and technology plays an increasing part both in understanding problems, particularly in arms control, but also in climate change. And it plays a very important part in looking at results as a result of this monitoring and verification in arms control and ways of reducing carbon emissions and methane in the question of climate change. So you're smack on with respect to all those things, and I would agree with the, the thrust of your question. I mean, I, I note Maxwell's moving out uh, with new programs and study in the area of emerging technologies, uh, both in the policy, law, and technical side. Um, so uh, they got the memo, your memo apparently. Um, so as we wrap up and head out to the reception, I want to give each of you uh, the opportunity to either say, so I'm, I guess apparently not, but say something optimistic uh, that, that we, we can look to, or, or tell us um, the one lesson 
we should keep in mind from all of what we've talked about and all of what you know about U.S.-Iran relations, what's the one lesson that people in this audience who are going to influence the policy outcome in the future should take away from all this? So you get something to be optimistic or lesson in three sentences. Lesson in one sentence, don't withdraw from international agreements by violating them. Fair enough. Secondly, optimism I gave you at the beginning in a kind of uh, extended way, the fact that there is an opportunity for diplomacy in dealing with Iran if we could wake up and be attentive and pay attention and do it. Excellent. Uh, Tom or Khalil? Let go, let Khalil go first. Okay. Let's so I would, I would agree with Professor, um, sorry, with the Ambassador uh, Pickering that the, one of the key things here is to remember some of the lessons of history, right? that one, diplomacy does work, diplomacy has worked. And to ignore kind of this knee-jerk uh, attempt, as we've seen um, over the past few years, that just because someone claims they can get a better deal doesn't mean they can get a better deal. Bravado only goes so far. We've seen it with the Bush administration, we saw it with, and we're seeing it with the current administration. Uh, for optimism, I will throw this out that we're 11 months away from 2020 from an election. <laughs> well, I almost made it through with Good for you. <laughs> okay, Tom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we seem, we seem to have, uh, pretty much converged on this. Uh, uh, I was going to suggest earlier that uh, we would do well to uh, uh, have done with the uh, sort of infatuation with regime change yes. as a solution to uh, foreign policy problems. Uh, the current administration, at the very least. Uh, but how's that for optimism? There's something yeah. that this current administration is doing right uh, is, uh, seems to have uh, pretty much forsworn uh, that, that approach. Except for themselves. Okay. okay. <laughs> Not your turn. Please continue. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that was, a, that was, that that, was basically good, the point yeah. I wanted yeah. to make. Very good. Um, well, uh, please um, join me in thanking uh, this wonderful uh, panel of discussions and then join them for a drink. Osama, a British friend of mine did a paper which was published in Survival. Do you know that? Oh, yeah.